played this episode of Star Trek Voyager called Parturition has alien hair pasta in it that mm. Neelix whips up for the, the crew to enjoy. But it made me wonder, what's your favorite pasta? My favorite pasta, honestly, I like mixing them. Like, mm. you know, like a, like a cereal. Like, like if spaghetti I've got and some, macaroni or something like yeah, that? Just, yeah, if I've got some rotini and some uh, ziti, I'll throw that together. Uh, you know, just a little bit of uh, mix it up a bit. Yeah. Um, but if I'm going out and I'm like getting, I can't, <laughs> I can't ask for that at a restaurant like a five year old. So. <laughs> With some ketchup on the side. Yeah. Uh, probably like a fettuccine. Or oh, really? Wow. I like the I like the flat noodles. Yeah. Yeah. I, I um, spaghetti's interestingly like spaghetti is at the bottom of my power rankings for pasta, but I really like mm-hmm. angel hair. I love angel hair pasta. Sure. So, so delicate. Sure. I uh I always um anytime I go out to get pasta, I get a rude awakening as to how much pasta I actually eat at home because you always order it and it's like it ends up being like a third of whatever you'd eat when you're at home. Ravioli's a ripoff. They give you like three oh, raviolis. It's the worst. Yeah. Ravio do not but get raviolis at a restaurant because <laughs> it is not worth the money. They're it's because so, it's always so like it's always like seasonal and shit too, yes. so it's like twice Pumpkin. as expensive. Yep. Yeah, and you get like four of them, and they're fine. Yeah, I I like them. They just they really, I I guess the restaurant idea is that one ravioli can, may not sit atop another ravioli on your plate. Is the thing, and right, at home yeah. you just dump them out of the out of the uh, oh yeah the pot yeah. right onto your plate, and you're all ready to go. Throw some oil on that shit so they're sliding around all over the place. I really like um the little rigatonis. They sell like mini rigatonis that are basically thick cylinders like rigatoni but they're cut more into like little circles as opposed to the long tube oh sure sure yeah i think they call yeah. them mezza rigatoni or something like that or mezzo or something but those are there's good there's so many pastas that i feel like have a specific purpose that i'm too afraid to get yep so like the, every time i go to the store there's ones that look like um the scoring uh game pieces from trivial pursuit yes yeah i don't know what those are for i assume they're for soup or something but every time i see them i'm like i bet that'd be pretty good in macaroni and cheese yeah they are but i'm they, afraid i don't want to get <laughs> called out it's it's a whole you have to pay extra attention to how long you're supposed to cook each one of them yeah we use those in um we do use those in soup those little uh pinwheel ones or whatever they're whatever yeah. they're called giant shells those are fun I, yeah i don't i'm not a big fan of shells uh, yeah um, I don't like baked shells at all. I don't. I don't know mm-hmm. why. I don't like lasagna either. So maybe that's Interesting. something. Yeah. Too much cheese. I don't like the flat noodle. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, okay. I, it's just it does. It seems like a cake to me, and I, I don't really. It, it's, it's weird because it's one of those like Mexican food things. It's like the ingredients are all the same in what I would eat otherwise. But if it's yeah. in a big ziti, I'd rather have a big ziti than a lasagna. Yeah, that's interesting because is I, you could say that a, a lasagna is a cake. But you couldn't really say that a cake is a lasagna. That's right. <laughs> We're just getting, you getting want down it to, to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just getting down to it on this episode. Parturition is the next episode of Star Trek Voyager that we're going to be covering. It's the seventh episode of the second season of Star Trek Voyager. It came out on October 9th, 1995, written by Tom Stazolski, or something like that. He's kind of a pasta-esque name. Directed by Jonathan Frakes. <laughs> In-universe date, not given, but it's 23 That sounded vaguely racist. <laughs> <laughs> um, like you were talking about the Italian guy down the street that you didn't like. He's got one of those pasta names. It was um, in a in a... A thing of how far have we fallen? I was listening to a podcast today that they were talking about sort of a random culture thing. It was a, um, it's the Reason Roundtable, so it's sort of like a libertarian political thing. But they always end with like what they've been consuming, and um, they talked about like one of their kids was listening to, it's like West Side Story or something, Mm -hmm. and on whatever app they were listening to. There's a song that has the words doo-wop in it, in the title, Mm -hmm. and they censored the WAP from it. Really? Yeah, because it it must just be algorithmically driven that we have to to censor WAP because it means Italian in 1945 or whatever. (laughs) Um, But it was just like, it's such a clear, 
it's such a it makes it maybe if you're the kid you're wondering like oh i didn't realize that was uh the song doo-wop or the style of music is a, a an ethnic stereotype or something but that's, that's why is that why disney plus cut out all the scenes where a bunch of guys stand around a flaming trash can and sing yeah i think so i get my warnings about the crows which are stand-ins for black people or something like that parturition this episode a trip to planet hell proves therapeutic for tom paris and neelix and has a little picture of an alien baby as the the front cover page. Yep. So this is the continuation of what is now a season runner of uh, Paris and Neelix and Kess, that love triangle, which I think ends th- this episode ends it. I think this is the last bit of this path. Mm-hmm. Um, and I thought a good place to start there was uh, before we get into the sci-fi aspects of this episode, which are kind of the thing that fixes everything. Uh, I have a lot of different thoughts, uh, conflicting thoughts about the Neelix and Tom Paris and Kess storyline. So a couple of points here. I thought that Parturition, this episode, was the only one that actually made the tone work for me, interestingly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's one thing. We can go in whatever one of these you want. Number two is that with the setup of Voyager... I actually think that this plot line is appropriate to try, but was badly executed. I don't think this is bad from the get-go, and I think it actually works as a Voyager storyline. So I'm kind of sad that they didn't really execute on it. And the third thing is just... this The tone that has to do with my first point about whether or not this is the, to- this is the only tone that worked in the episode and made it feel like appropriate uh, also makes it really feel dated as a star trek episode too at the same time like the way that it all wraps up and the way that they handle their issues with each other is very much Mm -hmm. of 90s star trek so it's a long way saying i didn't actually mind this one Uh, i thought this was maybe the best episode of season three we've seen which is not which is damning with faint praise or season two damning with faint praise but i kind of chuckled a little bit at least in the early part the first half where they were dealing with neelix paris and um Cass, like Neelix staring at Tom Paris as he's angrily like tossing that angel hair salad <laughs> made me laugh. I don't know. I, f- I find this story. I'm I'm interested in what you think about this jealousy storyline, because I think it was badly done, but I don't know if it was a mistake. Yeah, no, I would agree with pretty much everything you said. I think this episode is probably the best one as far as dealing with it in the tone and stuff, because like it's, it's silly at moments, but I, I do feel, I feel like, um, Neelix's emotional, uh, space that he's in feels more real to me here than turning him into Jake LaMotta in the last yeah. couple. Yeah. It's a um, little bit funny. They play it a little bit silly. Yeah. yeah. It's a little bit funny, but it's also there's pathos built into it. Like you do kind of feel bad for him because Paris, I, I think the thing is that this one, it, it almost feels like this should have been split in half and in between the two halves should have been the other two episodes. Yeah, because you the stuff with Paris and Kess comes out of nowhere so much. And in this one, he he pretty plainly says what's going on. And I think that actually went a long way to really understanding where everybody stood, because everything with with Paris was just kind of there before. And it seemed kind of weird. Um and so, therefore, Neelix's reactions seem kind of weird. Yeah, but almost accidental one, on the part of Tom Paris. Like, there was no intent yeah. in what he was doing. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that the thing that, that harms it is it's difficult to have a love triangle where you kind of feel for everybody involved when you don't know the motivations of yeah. everybody. Yep. And not knowing Paris's motivations makes it a little bit dicey as far as uh, – following it and judging whether or not neelix's uh reactions are warranted or not because you know if like if, if in the first episode uh paris had been like you know harry i'm in love with Cass and i'm gonna steal her away from that furry bastard yeah. then when he then when <laughs> neelix starts getting really weird about it it's like even if he doesn't know that paris said that you know that paris said that so you're like yeah fuck that guy right yeah. um and they 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 do kind of finally approach it full bore here and i do think that they it's it's pretty good i actually i really like this episode i thought Mm. this was um 
overall, it, it was it was interesting to me because I agree. I think this is probably the best one of season two. Uh, it was, I feel like this is of the same kind of episode as like breaking the ice in enterprise Yeah, yeah. where they have a thing that they have to do. There's a science fiction thing built into it. They run into some problems. Um, and what the, 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 there, there, there is story beyond just the plot. Um, however, it also felt the most like they were just trying to recreate TNG to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's because it was such a sort of procedural, let's just deal with this slightly sci-fi concept thing, but it just, it felt the, it, it was the first one that really felt to me like, oh, they're just trying to recapture the TNG thing with throwing in some uh, uh, Deep Space Nine lighting on the bridge anytime they go to Red Alert, which to be fair, I actually did like. I yeah. like it when they shut the lights off. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I thought the, the, the Love Triangle stuff was pretty good. Um, I think I would have liked Kess to have a little bit more agency in there. Yeah, it's tough, uh, tough for her. She's she's the weak link in that triangle. Yeah, because it's like she finds out about it. She can't do anything or talk to anybody about it. And then by the time she can, they're like, oh, no, it's fine. We're cool. And she's yeah. Like, oh, although. OK. I did really like her doctor conversation where the doctor knew that Paris is in love because of his like diagnostic capabilities. Yes, that was really good. I, I really like that scene I like that conversation. Yeah, I thought that was a really good scene between those two. I was a little bit confused uh, confused isn't the right word, but I was a little bit unsure of how they were trying to play that scene ultimately because the doctor's got the hots for Cast too, right? It seems that way. I, I I'm Maybe less they're certain not of they're it. not committing they're I don't think they're committing, committing to, it. to it. Yeah. yeah. That's fine. That's better if they don't. But yeah, it's I more of that a mentor. Really it's good. more of a like a father daughter relationship. I think between those. I've two. seen those videos. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah, I liked that. Just to stick on that scene for a second, I like that scene because I think occasionally the show gets a little lazy with the doctor in how they write him, and yeah. so he kind of just becomes a human in a lot of episodes until he announces that he can't do something. But his yeah. approach to what he was looking at there is only capable from him and i thought that it was nice to yep. get that reminder that he is not you know quote unquote a real person yeah i thought the doctor was great all throughout like even the stuff where he's uh um eavesdropping on yeah. <laughs> the bridge and janeway basically voices the fear that everybody that owns an alexa has yep um like that stuff was really good I, I also this is a small detail i don't really i haven't really noticed them do this as much on this show and it's always my favorite thing about star trek i have to give jonathan frakes credit for this but when they pull up the doctor on the computer screen he is looking so far off camera yeah <laughs> and that's my favorite detail is that they look at the camera they don't look at the screen no, i'm sorry they look at the screen they don't look at the camera yeah and so their eyes are always off from where they are on the screen it's a, it's a great little detail it's someone zooming um, with uh two monitors and the zoom window is on the monitor that they're exactly not, not looking at exactly yeah. yes uh but yeah i thought he was they handled him really well um <laughs> they do have that one moment where i feel like this is something it's a, it's an affliction that character actors have where they get so good at playing quirky, for lack of a better term, quirky characters, that the minute that you have to have them do something sincere, it feels weird. Yeah. And Picardo gets very close to that space where it's like, he looks like he's going to get emotional, and I don't like this. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. he's, Robert Picardo is, I've never seen him in like an emotional role, and seeing him kind of like vulnerable kind of weirds me out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's not built for it what scene do you think that was the scene with Kess is that the yes okay. yeah. yeah towards the end of the scene with Kess like his he he starts like getting a little bit more um uh sympathetic or something yeah sympathetic and familiar with his body yeah. language and yeah. like the the expression on his face and I was like I don't know if I like this mm, yeah <clears throat> yeah fortunately it cuts off I think before anything goes uh too wrong there but i did like that scene although it doesn't it doesn't completely save the the kess thing because i guess it's just kind of fundamentally set up wrong to have mm -hmm. a good outlook on this situation 
Um, that's the other thing that's weird too. Is like, yeah, they they call into this, they call into the equation that she's only two years old. Yeah, she has no experience in this stuff. Yeah, which I think can work. I don't know if they really do enough with it. Um, my favorite line in that scene though is, uh, uh, I forget the lead in, but he he talks about it, the autopsy, and she's like, "Why would you think I wanted to see that?" And he says, "Well, you've always been interested yeah. in autopsies." Yeah. <laughs> Very, it's a very data kind of line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I liked it. Um, yeah, it's it's funny because I, I think that the reason I think that this kind of works on Voyager is that as we've said, like Voyager tends to, at least in the storytelling, it's doing, it's moving away from its core concept into more TNG ish standalone, um, non serialized stuff. But mm-hmm. I think there is a space for like. You know, if if we were to redo this series as a modern Star Trek show, I think there's a way that you can do this storyline, which is to just so dissent like discord amongst crew members for jealousy, like sexual jealousy reasons. I think that's I think that works the best in Voyager. It's the show that makes the most sense where that would happen, really, because sure. op- options yeah. are limited for these people. Um, it's. It's funny because the tone that makes it work in this episode is the is the tone that would not allow it to exist for a longer period of time in this show if it remained that way. So it's like because it's treating it here in a Star Trek appropriate way, it's kind of silly. It's not really super serious like the fight between Paris and Neelix is for comedy and stuff like mm-hmm. that. It's all very mm-hmm. You know, the, and the joke of they have to like sit next to each other on the shuttle ride down, and Paris is keep talking and you talk about how far they are, and Neox is saying you don't have to, t- to talk for my benefit or something. Like there, there's a a level of humor in it, but I think that in the in the context of the show, it's actually a a serious dramatic storyline that could have happened in a more serious show, I guess. And I think that's what's yeah. so interesting about it. I don't even know if it needs to be that much more serious, honestly. Mm. I mean, I think you've, but but I do agree. I think you could have gotten a whole season out of this, uh, especially if you've got this, you know, the the scene that Neelix has with Paris, where he talks about how the other people on the ship kind of call him a coward and a traitor or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And how he's kind of alone. <clears throat> you could work that into a season arc where Paris is actively trying to date on the ship. Yeah, it's, it's his like, growth arc for him, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's not quite working, but he's spending more time with Kess, and he's they're hitting it off, and so he's realizing that, you know, he actually likes Kess. And that kind of, I think you could have done, if you really wanted to do this, I think you could get a, a lot out of it, actually. Yeah, and it would have made uh, Non Sequitur, the Harry Kim in his alternate timeline, make more sense, because Paris in that storyline could see the alternate version of not being on Voyager for this plot line. You know what I mean? Like, he, right, right. That's his, that, it's a reminder of where Paris is coming from um, that the show hasn't done a particularly great job of doing now. But like you, in rebooting this series, I think that there is an idea here that I would defend because I think a, people, a lot of people just dismiss this storyline, and I don't think it's that bad. I, I agree with what you're saying is that the problem for Neelix from the start is that they never established where Paris stood in this whole thing. So Neelix just comes across as crazily paranoid about stuff. Mm. And yeah. it would just work better if, if, as you were saying, even if the audience was the only thing that knew, just to give a little bit of empathy to Neelix in that situation, to know what's going on. It, it would have gone a long way. I, I just don't think this was the colossal failure of a storyline that it's made out to be um, in some online channels. No, I think this episode saves it yeah. uh, from from crashing. Honestly, um, yeah, it was bad before this one. I guess, yeah, so. I'm I'm a little bit surprised that they wrapped it up so quickly. I mean, mm-hmm. it's kind of kind of what I was saying before that you could get a lot more out of this, but it just seems like something that could you can kind of always have in the background if you need something to dip into for a minute yeah um without necessarily having to pay, having to pay it off immediately um this is all the behind the scenes <clears throat> drama uh pillar did not like this storyline and the other mm-hmm. producers and writers did like it uh pillar wanted to wrap it up and the other producers decided that at the time of wrapping like one of the one of the pro arguments to wrap it up is that they didn't like interestingly they did not like 
discontent between cast members, like characters on the show. Um, Interesting. Which flies in the face of their concept quite a bit. Right, but yeah. It's, yeah. It, it is they are trying to hold on to that TNG style of no one's really fighting with each other. And I don't know, it's interesting to me that they thought that that was necessary to change even with what little discord there was prior to this. It's not like Tom Paris and Neelix really hated each other. Mm. The Yeah, the argument I think is just that Neelix was not properly established to make his um and he wasn't written and he wasn't he wasn't played well to, to sort of make this feel less annoying and more of an uh, interesting thing or a a serious plot line that could be worth looking at additionally yeah it's just so strange how <laughs> this show has been so fascinating as far as potential versus execution yeah, yeah. <clears throat> in a way that I mean, maybe it's too early to make this comparison, but do you think that this has less of a follow through on its premise than Enterprise does? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think I would agree. En- Enterprise is um, Enterprise bought into its concept, but it did it by sort of doing a TNG thing. Interestingly, like the, yeah. like Voyager to buy into its concept would have to avoid the TNG setup and storytelling method of episodic standalone things. So I think that's the difference between them. But Enterprise, at least in its early couple seasons, did try to do early versions of First Contact and stuff like that. That would make sense in yeah. in what its setup is. Yeah, because from what I remember, our criticisms of Enterprise as a concept was never the concept in and of itself. Yeah. It's just that like kind of the the, the point that they chose to, to launch from seemed like they were leaving some stuff on the table and they never quite um it, it seemed like they kind of got caught up with other stuff when they had such a good concept in front of them yeah um i would say whereas, they didn't they didn't they didn't make they didn't make like an overarching universe that would feel like you were in the proto federation like everything yeah, just kind of felt yeah. very standalone and i think that to make that work in the enterprise context you have to have like a little bit of a universe behind it that would be ds9-esque where you you sort of get a sense of where things stand outside of the ship yeah and whereas voyager they they sell you on like a really great hook and then they pretty much abandon it abandon it for just kind of stylistic retreads of uh tng for the most part yeah because the tng method can't support these kinds of stories really that this show is set up for unfortunately it's too bad man it would be i would be frustrated as hell if i was a writer on this show yeah if you've got you know you come in the door thinking it's going to be one thing and then the guy who created the show was like no actually no we can't do that we can't have (laughs) discord among these characters (laughs) well what are we doing here they're all wearing the same uniform, Bill. Haven't you noticed <laughs> since the pilot we fixed that fixed that problem? Uh, yeah. I am Michael Pillar. I am the pillar of this idea. <laughs> and I say that everyone must be friends. Might be a tough Gene pill to swallow, Bill. Yeah, that's the way Gene would have wanted things. <laughs> <laughs> We've seen that. I haven't seen much or heard much from Rick in this series. He's out there, but hasn't uh yeah. hasn't doesn't have his greasy. <laughs> they they won't show me scripts. I don't know why. <laughs> don't worry though. I got a great idea for a lady that we can replace Kess in a couple seasons. <laughs> it's kinda like Kess, but it's like seven to nine points better. <laughs> <laughs> nine inches taller. Getting getting other things. Uh, very excited. He's got his cat suit. We're still a ways away from seven. Actually, it'll be interesting when we when we get to her. Um. So, after the love triangle, this dovetails into a traditional sci-fi story where Neelix mm-hmm. and Paris on their uh, where they meet the baby they, from dinosaurs. Yeah, they meet the, the dinosaur baby. Um, I liked the little puppet. I thought he was kind of neat. Yeah, I, yeah. There's nothing really wrong with that storyline. And I kind of like that they run into the alien mother, and it's like a scary thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and they yeah. run away. I, I enjoyed all that. It was it's kind of boring, but it wasn't uh, it wasn't offensive. No, I mean, like you know, it reminded me of those episodes of Enterprise that we liked, where yeah. it's like they just kind of had their thing they had to do. Uh, they ran into some some hiccups along the way that forced them to work together in a way that they weren't prepared for. And there were some surprises about what they were going to find and stuff. And ultimately they get the job done. Yeah. Um, 
even the I actually even really liked the stuff on Voyager outside the planet because, you know, they don't have any contact with the ship that they're they're standing off with. Yeah. So you get you have to get what's going on kind of from the body language of the ship. And then you find out that, oh, there's these things in there. It's oh, it's a mother. It's clearly protecting it's protecting the babies from this other ship and stuff yeah. like I actually I thought that was a really really good uh little sci-fi story. Yeah. Yeah, I I thought it was um it was tidy sort of like it it I guess my the, the main I guess there's a question of whether or not it's a story that you find believable would bind Paris and Neelix together. Yeah, like that's true. Yeah. There there's a there's a little bit of like um, maybe I'd, I don't, I don't know if I'd call it after school special, but it, it wraps up so neatly their conflict that it just I I sit there and I go, is this the storyline that would really f- fix these guys and make them recognize right. each other? Because yeah. the motherhood parenting thing has really nothing to do with their fight or their conflict. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's that. I would say that is a bit of a weakness because they do kind of. Uh, well, I guess it depends on how you look at it. Because, like, honestly, the thing that starts the process is that conversation they have, right? And wh- where Paris comes clean and, and uh, Neelix kind of comes clean about what people think about him and yep. he apologizes and they kind of have their – they make their peace there. And then the other stuff is kind of piggybacking off of that where they kind of have this new start that allows them to work together together. And bond a little bit in a way that they never have because they don't really spend much time together. Right. So yeah. I I would say that it doesn't bother me that much because I think the the scene their heart to heart scene is is pretty strong. Yep. Um. And so kind of anything that they did after that I think would have been sufficient for like a bonding thing. Um. But I do understand that it it is not really thematically on brand like it's not like kes is pregnant or something yeah, you know where yeah. where and they're kind of fighting over her in that sense while, while she's pregnant about who's going to take care of you know that kind yeah of thing. or just a war you know like I, I was expecting a war on this planet where like people are fighting over something that doesn't mm-hmm. make a lot of sense it kind of a um yeah last yeah that too thing. yeah um they could have if they wanted to they could have gone they could have stuck with the baby and, and added in some sort of actual predator kind of situation. Yep. yep. You know, I don't know. Maybe that's infantilizing Kess too much metaphorically, probably. But, uh, but you know, I I I think uh, I think getting over the heavy stuff and having them come out the other end and work together on a on a plot that's serious but lighthearted. Yeah. Yeah. I think works pretty well. Yeah, it's the again, it's just the right tone. I think for Star yeah. for for this yeah. era of Star Trek at least. I don't know if Discovery or something would pull it off. Um the uh the Could you imagine the fight they would have had in Discovery? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> We'd still be talking about it. Just did the, they did they did they not do did they never have Ash yeah. Tyler get into a fight with somebody over Michael Burnham in the first season? I can't I don't remember I don't did. think so. Uh Lorca would have been the only I don't I don't think they did. Yeah. I think it's just a lot of passion between those two. There's no no real conflict or anything like that. That's out of the yeah. Klingon thing. Uh but your reminder of this is the nineties is uh I'm sure what, you know, R slash men's right activist subreddit or something gets up in arms when um uh Newix picks up the baby and it calms down and Tom Paris goes, I guess you aren't a godfather. You're a godmother. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a sick burn to all you fathers out there. Uh, that's um, that's my. You know, there's always this fight online about whether or not people, um, when a father is watching their kids, if you should get offended when someone says, "Are you babysitting today?" Oh, yeah. chalk, chalk that up under things that I do not give a shit about yeah. uh, whatsoever. But it's <laughs> yes. constantly on the internet. Yeah. You can tell me I'm babysitting. Whatever, who cares? Like, take it personally. Yeah, yeah. It's like, yes, I am, and I'm just waiting for these kids' real parents to come <laughs> take them away and make my life easier again. I'm a French nanny, if you couldn't tell. <laughs> that I, I just don't. I don't know. Like the um, 
you know, what Tom Paris says here is, is worse on a scale. I don't even think what Paris says is all that bad, but it's just like, I just never understood it. It is a little bit of a tangent, but I, I don't understand getting bent out of shape about being told that you're babysitting your kids. I never, I never saw babysitting as something non-parental or something like that. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Well, who knows? Parturition. Anything else to talk about with this one? Yeah. A couple things. Mm. One. You know that you know how I know that we are now officially in season two and no longer using episodes from season one. Hair, Janeway's got a new haircut, baby. This is her later uh, series haircut that she's testing yeah. out. I think. Yeah, this actually looks um, like seasons five, six, and seven. I think this is her style. Yeah, yeah. I'm convinced. I don't remember what episode it was, but an episode in season one. There's one episode where they change her hair. Yeah, it's yeah. not. It's it's still kind of pulled back, but it's not as big. Yep. And so I thought that's what they were going to go for. I wasn't expecting like this full, the full Dana Scully. No, she's going to, um, this is just a test. I think she's going to bun it up again. She's going to. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I interesting. Think she, okay. I think she reverts back. I think this is just a, a test or something. I mean, I, um, I think I prefer the bun. I, her hair here is just kind of helmety and large. It is, I, mm-hmm. I don't know. It's a little bit distracting. It's not, it doesn't, in the same way that Christopher Pike's hair in Strange New Worlds is sort of distracting i find her hair distracting in this uh, context yeah i i think oddly enough it actually does change her demeanor for me a little bit because she does seem a little bit more relaxed and i don't know if she's she's probably not doing anything differently but it's just that she doesn't have such a a a constricted haircut haircut yeah i think it just subconsciously makes her feel like she's a little bit more relaxed than she was in the first season yeah I feel like I'm losing my grasp on Janeway a little bit. I she's, I think it was this episode. This episode, there's a scene where she's standing next to two male officers, and they do a, a reasonably good job normally of kind of hiding how short she is compared to mm-hmm. the other characters. Um, but I, I thought it was, I don't know. There's there's a lot of character design I think that would go into her where if if it is such a smaller actress playing that role, there is kind of like that kind of has to work its way into how you design her in some like how you design her mm-hmm. as a character in terms of what she like, whether she's, um, it ties into that. What did we think Janeway was doing in season one? Was she overcompensating for things because she's mm-hmm. new at this or is this just the way that she is? I don't know. Janeway's kind of in a, a weird spot for me. I, I couldn't really define her at this point. I don't think if I would had to. Yeah. This was an interesting Janeway episode for me because it felt like most of the episode was her going, yeah, well, uh, you guys figure this out. I'm going to be in the ready room having a coffee. Yeah. A lot of ready room breaks during emergencies. Just <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let me know when you get I think, there. I think maybe that's part of what made me made it feel like TNG to me because it had a, a big kind of Picard energy where he's like, okay, I see what's going on. Let me know when you guys do what you have to do. I'll be in my room. Yeah. Yeah. I, and... I think that there's there's one aspect of Neelix here that I think that they still don't really get right, um, and Janeway has to do with it, which is that when Neelix puts up a fight about having to do something, no one tells him to shut up, really. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, I think he he he's it's not even Paris; it's Neelix who's arguing at the end about whether or not they can have to beam up right away or if they're going to wait there for a minute. Yeah. And Janeway gives him a lot of leeway about this stuff, and I I I think it's just um. It just seems odd because it seems like Neelix should be the character that Janeway is the most abrupt with because he is just kind of like the the useless cog in the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I, I would expect a better pushback from Janeway in that situation. Yeah, that's you probably could have had Janeway be a little bit more insistent and then have Paris jump in and right. be like, listen, yeah. honestly, we got to do this. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing that I wanted to point out is, man, Harry Kim leaves that food behind like he is at a Jamaican resort. <laughs> <laughs> he went to go get tartar sauce. He's, they didn't. He's, they didn't have it. He just <laughs> said "fuck it" and went to the bridge and left that entire plate of yep. spaghetti, yeah, on the table. Didn't even bust his fucking dish. Yeah, <laughs> entitled prick. He had to go. His um, his conversation with Kess is funny too. When he sort of sits with her alone, he you get definite that Harry's trying to trying to make his way. Into the, into some sort of relationship with her too. He's got a big smile on his face. They're talking about I mean, something semi tragic, I think. 
honestly, isn't that the reality of how this would probably go? Because, I mean, there's a lot of people on the ship, but Kess definitely feels like the one female friend of the friend group. Yeah, yeah, right. And I feel like in reality, everybody on everybody on the main cast would would take a shot at it at some point. If she if I mean, I guess even, even if she is with Neelix, uh, <laughs> apparently nobody nobody thinks of him as much of a threat. <laughs> it's um even scientifically, I think you could argue it. You know, there's like, you know, there's always that genetic thing of that if you were to repopulate, each female has to have different kids with each male to make a gene pool that's mm-hmm. sustainable. Mm-hmm. You know, so let's get into that math, please, show. But Harry, I mean, Harry Kim sneaking in with his chubby little fingers in the pie. I don't need that. I don't want to get into the the ethics and the math involved here, but I mean, like, she's got to, if she has kids, those kids are grown up in a year. Yep. So it's just like that whole ship is going to be fucking for the next 75 years. Yeah. Barely one or whatever. Everybody having sex with everybody else's kids. <laughs> everyone, else is, everyone else is quickly aging children. Oh, what Voyager could have been. Well, maybe we'll get there one day. You got a, a ship full of eight-year-olds who all die within weeks of each other. <laughs> Shit, we should have had some regular kids so we could have someone man the ship. Mass graves on Voyager. They lose another shuttle in this episode, too. Just thought I'd bring that up. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. All right. We'll go to patron comments then. Thanks, everybody. Patreon.com slash the Penske file if you want to support the show. <gasps> go there. Patreon.com slash the Penske file. First one is Tax Owlbear. He says, Parcher. I can't say the word because it's one of these weird words that when I see it, it does not look right to me. Parturition. Clear prime directive violation. That alien baby hadn't developed warp yet, but his mother did. It was a big, um, it was one of those weird scale things too with that alien ship. I, I so many times that my opinion changed about whether or not it was bigger or smaller than mm. the uh, the Voyager. Voyager is always portrayed as a very small ship, I think, kind of wisely. This is Norman Buckwald who says, Parturition. Neelix's jealousy is so intolerable, it's more difficult to watch than these those bad alien puppets. One spaghetti shirt stain out of five. That was actually one of my favorite parts of the episode is after the fight when uh, she's like, come to the bridge now. And Paris is like, like right now? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was um behind the scenes fact. It was the first time in Star Trek they'd used wet food in a food thing oh, incident interesting. like this. Yeah. So I did, it was one thing I did catch that maybe... Uh, I just had my eyes down or something. After they have the food fight scene and they go to see Janeway, uh, Kess pulls one of the, I think, Neelix aside and was like, is it true? Did you guys really get into a fight? Wasn't she in the mess hall? She leaves. At she a, le- She yeah, does leave? Okay, leaves, I must have yeah. looked looked away for a second or something because I didn't, I, I didn't think that she had, I thought the whole point was that Harry Kim leaves and then that leaves Kess and Paris there. And then oh, maybe she leaves and that's when Neelix comes yes. over to confront Paris. Ne- Neelix okay. only talks to Paris when he sees that Kess leaves the, ah, the dining okay. hall. Yep. Gotcha. Uh, Kyle Barrett says, Parturition, this one feels like someone delved into the deepest wellspring of my being, plundered my greatest terrors and hates of Voyager, and managed to mold that disgusting sputum into the form of a single episode. An episode that stars Tom Paris and Neelix, both at their most irritating, and the nightmare fuel baby from the dinosaurs sitcom, too. Forget Planet Hell, this is episode hell, with Michael Pillar deciding to write Neelix's jealousy out of the show, but only before spending a whole episode wallowing in it, and it hurts that the writers just don't realize what an unattractive and repugnant character Paris currently is. This is the third shuttle the Voyager has lost from its seemingly infinite supply, and the Doctor is one of those people who never looks in near the webcam on the Zoom call. There we go. Love it. One out of five. <clears throat> wow. Man, I'm surprised. I am too. I am too. This it is- was... They should have had that dinosaur baby say, not the mama, though, because yeah. that would have been applicable in this situation. <laughs> it would beam out of there, and then it could look at the camera and say it just uh, doesn't seem like it's contamination. This is Wes Durland, says, parturition. Food fight. The first time we see the hairstyle Janeway is known best for, poor Neelix, so insecure, two out of five. Brandon Neil Howell says, I had to look up what the title of this episode means. It means childbirth, apparently. Childish is more like it. Not even the cute bird can save this episode from being the one where Neelix becomes insufferable. I know Kess is only two years old, but how old is Neelix? Six, zero, faux lime aftershaves out of five. 
This is so odd to me because I don't I don't think he's way less abrasive in this one than he was in the last ones. I, I would agree. He's um he doesn't seem as unhinged in this one. Yeah, I don't. I mean, obviously, yeah, he's being childish, but I don't know. It's it seemed to it worked for me more here than it has in the previous ones. Yeah, I mean, arguably, <clears throat> there uh, the whole problem between them is semi childish. You know, this is not. Oh, sure. It's not really sure. a. It's not really like a forty fifty year old problem at this. Like it's it's set up that way, and I think it makes sense. But I um I don't know. Like Neelix said, his worst was. <laughs> Like, even though I enjoyed Neelix at his worst was asking how she how Kess knew where the room numbers were, I think. You know, like yes. that's it's yeah. that kind of a thing. Yeah. This is uh <clears throat> point X or G I just sent to you. A whole episode about jealous jealous Neelix. Oof. One thing I am remembering more and more through this rewatch is how annoying early Neelix can be. At least this episode did give us another classic Voyager line. Set a course for planet hell, Commander. I, yeah, that was a good line. I, it, I wish the, <laughs> I wish the rest of the show lived up to that line. But. Jonathan J.K. Moore says, "Unbelievable amount of infighting. This is what we get for conflict instead of the Maquis versus Federation officers' difference with ideals. A jealous bit of tussling in a food fight. Two hatched lizard eggs out of five. Grappler John Zorn is this next comment, which I'm sending to you post haste. A pity this episode wasn't three minutes longer so we could see the implied Kess Neelix Paris threesome. Mm-hmm. Like, they, they told me to cut it. I pitched it, but they didn't <laughs> want to do it. Uh, like it or not, this episode does solve some festering characterization problems with a rare moment of serialization. For once, Technobabble isn't central to the plot or resolution, and there are none of the nonsensical anomalies or pseudo-cultural insensitivities that will remain Voyager's hallmark problems. Still, the absence of these things doesn't make for a quality episode, and this one feels like a mishmash of 80s movie tropes in the vein of three enemy minds and an animatronic baby. Three interspecies double plays out of five. You know, the Technobabble, <laughs> that's a really good point. It is Maybe a good that's point. One I, like of the this, I like this comment, yeah. Yeah, maybe that's one of the reasons why it stood out to me is because it it's it is very light on that stuff. Yeah, it's and, really and just the, places, the um the pl- the planet is the only bit yeah. of techno babble. Yeah, and, and you get a little bit when they're talking about like the shield generators or whatever yeah. on the other ship, but they kind of a uh, little bit of hangover from the the uh, Tuvok and Chakotay stuff there, where Chakotay yep. jumps yep. in with the uh, the the, the punchline. But yeah, what'd you think of the um the 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 planet makes them itch thing is that necessary it's just a way to portray uh, that it's dangerous there yeah i mean i think it's tonally in line with the rest of the show where yeah. it's it's a it's a problem but it's not like life threatening yeah you know? well they will die right well yeah I, I should say it's not like it's not like they beam Bleeding down out to of the surface eyes. of venus or something yeah it's <laughs> yeah. not it's not it's not total recall when you go to the surface of Mars with your helmet off or something. Yeah, yeah. that's fair. No, I like that comment. I agree about the um, techno babble. Um, I also I can't really disagree. It does feel like a mishmash of eighties like eighties tropes and stuff like that. But he gave it a three out of five. Eric McGowan says the only good thing about this episode is that they will finally mostly kill off Neelix's jealousy over Kess moving forward. I suppose an episode of misery is worth that in the long run. Aaron Million has this to say about things. I should probably arrange the windows closer so I don't have to travel across both screens. Go ahead. (laughs) Unfortunately, Neelix and Paris survive the shuttle crash. Unfortunately, Voyager manages to rescue both of them before the giant reptile kills them. Unfortunately, this episode was made. Even the food fight sucked. One baby reptile out of five. Changeling says, you know what is more charming than a grown man dating a two-year-old? Making him extremely jealous and petty. This episode feels like it's straight out of the Lazy Writer's Handbook. All right, let's put two characters that don't like each other in a survival situation. What do they do? Yell and scream. Good. Now how do they bond? Baby. We can't have a baby on set. Jim Henson's Nightmare. Genius. One, (laughs) not the mama, out of five. Uh, That is not a real comment. Artorius has this to say. After watching Elogium, I cannot fathom why Paris, let alone anyone, would find Kess sexually attractive. It also comes off a little rapey having grown men fawn over someone who only has two years' experience actually existing. 
That aside, I was very bored by this episode, literally falling asleep and having to finish it the next day. <clears throat> Neelix is annoying. Kess's dialogue with the doctor feels wooden. At least Paris was the bigger man and chose not to pursue a girl in a relationship with another guy. To be honest, nobody should even be thinking about having that kind of relationship with a two-year-old to begin with. Two hell planets out of five. <clears throat> as, they, as they say on Arrested Development, if that's what you call it, you're definitely not ready to have it. <laughs> <laughs> I just think of whatever uh, LEG Making would have to say about this situation. Um, which would be? Uh, he just he has those sketches where it's like, if there's fluff on the muff, then she's old enough. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Jaron Hatch says, the best thing that can be said about this episode is that it begins the conclusion of the Neelix is jealous over Kess arc. This episode is more concerned with Paris and Neelix's feelings than with Kess, who gets bad advice from the doctor. Really? And it's more or less used as a prop. At least it's boring and forgettable because the episode doesn't warrant real estate in my brain. And would it have killed them to have the dinosaur baby smack Neelix and say, not the mama? Two flying spaghetti mm -hmm. monsters out of five. That spaghetti looked terrible, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> it, looked really, it looked really bad. Why is he tossing dry dry pasta? Neelix, you got to put sauce on the thing if you're going to toss yeah. it. Like that. I don't know. You put oil on it or something, but I mean, if you got to put sauce there, you don't really need the, the oil. No, but, yeah. You, you, it's just slipping off your plate at that point. Unnecessary. I'm getting the feeling that Neelix is a bad cook. Yeah. <laughs> no one's really commented on that uh, to this point, but uh, Leola roots, they're always looking for that stuff. Although it's it's kind of a nice touch that they still, for some reason, need to look for food all the time, you know? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's yeah. a good thing or a bad thing. Even there, though, like, you know, the, the setup to this episode is we haven't looked for, we haven't refilled our our uh, supplies in weeks. Yeah. And then they do the episode and they still don't resupply and then it's it's not an issue anymore. So my thing I was, was wondering, I, oh, sorry, I was just gonna say, I was wondering, I was, I was, I thought maybe they would find a way to like harness the shit in the air down yeah, there because yeah. clearly it was could feed you yeah protein rich or it was the whole planet was had creatine sandstorms yep. going all the time or yep. something yep <clears throat> the uh one thing that struck me was when they find the planet uh chicote brings it up he's like well we found this planet that potentially has some proteins and food on and Janeway says oh what's the bad news he goes well it's a day out of our our way they're they're on like a hundred year journey yeah <laughs> is, is is one day really gonna really gonna like is anyone gonna complain about that day it was it was and a weird the shit, dialogue the shit that they've gone out of their way for already yeah. at this point yeah yeah not worth it uh did i you read i read the last one right did i uh i read who the, the hell was it I, I read jaron i read jaron's comment so this is yours this is clef it's sent to you now Paris has a love bug to itch, and Neelix is a son of a bitch. There's a lot here to hate, but with direction from Frakes, it ends up entertainingly kitsch. Three overdone camera shakes out of five. Oh, I even I disagree. Like the the crash in the shuttle was my favorite shuttle crash I think I've ever seen. <laughs> I thought the camera was moving appropriately. A latte librarian says, "Parturition." I watched this with my brother, who was high, and he thought that set course for planet <laughs> hell was hilarious. Two hatchlings out of five. That, like, they definitely should have had some heavy metal guitar riff after that line. Yes. Yep. Like, has nobody <laughs> sampled? you got to sample that, like, in, in front of your death metal song. Yep. <laughs> I, I can't imagine planet, planet Hell hasn't been used before. Is that a reference to something? I don't know. I Maybe it's no quoting idea. some, some 60s uh, sci-fi B-movie. This is Matt Ross. This has got to be the low point of the jealousy from Neelix, from the spaghetti hair food fight to the bad puppetry. I wonder where the money went and why is Neelix so jealous? Did he forget the tongue swelling and the mucus? Jeez, I was itching to get away from this episode and I wasn't on that planet. One bad bird head puppet out of five. Jonas says, did anyone think that the baby alien looks like the big <clears throat> turtle Morla who lives in the swamps of sadness and the never ending story? Oh, I don't remember yeah, okay. that. I don't remember the turtle. I admit, I found the jealousy arc in this episode a comforting arc to watch unfold, if only because we were watching real characters who weren't Ensign Kim. It was not a good episode, but I enjoyed it for the mostly background serviceable television that it is. Two out of five. It reminded me a little bit, the puppet of, uh, yeah, the, the Henson Ninja Turtles, specifically um, 
what's his name? Toka, the big snappy yeah. turtle from yeah. Ninja Turtles too. Yeah. <clears throat> I was I was hoping Shredder would show up and go, Damn babies. Damn babies. Oh. Hey, I watched a clip. I haven't seen the first Ninja Turtles in for forever, oh, but I watched a clip so on good. YouTube. It's it's um what a what a strange movie. Um, it holds it just, up so well. Does it? Yeah. It, yeah. It, it looks really odd. Um, it, it does. That was the like the most successful independent movie to like the Blair Witch, I think. Yeah. <laughs> it's got like, it was the scene, the scene where, I don't know if Shredder really died. It's like Shredder falls off the roof into the garbage truck. Oh, yeah. Is that the yep. end of the movie? That is the end of the movie, yeah. And a guy just like... A guy just goes, oops, and leans on yeah. the button and crushes him. That's Casey Jones. Casey That's Jones Casey Jones. That. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oops. Oops. Yeah, it's just, um, I don't know. It just it, It's a very odd-looking movie with Shred- uh, Splinter's like dangling Shredder by holding him on the, the stick over the edge. And yeah. It just it looks weird. It's, it's, um, it's really interestingly shot because, especially if you look at the, the those two movies back-to-back, the first one is so dark. Mm. And I don't know if it's just cinematography choices or if they're doing that to hide some of the seams on the suits and stuff yeah but it's like especially in the 80s coming off of the ninja turtles cartoon and stuff you show Mm, up to that movie and it's like everything's in the darkness Raphael swears at people uh shredder is talking about murdering children and stuff and michelangelo likes to party with a little bit of (laughs) yayo he doesn't just like to have uh balloons at a a party he likes to actually party yeah it is it is a i don't know it's weird i'd I'd have to watch it again i haven't seen the whole thing obviously undiscovered mugato was our final comment so that i just sent to you someone was flipping through a biology textbook when they titled this episode I suppose it's not just referencing the street shark rubber puppet that hatched on that itchy planet, but really the birth of Ton Paris and Neelix's mutual understanding and friendship. But this show takes too many awkward swings when it comes to people being attracted to Kess. I did not like, I sorry, I did like the pissed off mommy lizard alien, though. She wasn't taking any shit. Two not the mamas out of five. Thanks, patrons. If you want to leave comments about the episodes, you can go to patreon.com slash the Penske file and leave your thoughts there by supporting the show. Love right. to see that the Dinosaurs TV show from 30 years ago is still present in so many people's minds. Yeah, all probably seven episodes of it have been seared into our, our minds. Yeah. That's one of those shows that, uh, you know, there's always those shows that are kind of like high energy, kind of like fun shows, and you find out they have incredibly depressing endings. Yep. That would, you know how that one ends? Is it not the comet or global warming or something? It's the ice age. Ice age. That's it. And yeah. so, like the, the show ends with them looking outside as the snow is piling up, and they're like, "Huh, <laughs> this seems like a lot of snow." Yep. <laughs> and that's the very very similar to the ending of Alf, where he just gets captured by the CIA, and the implication is that he's dead now. Yeah, yeah. It's um, it has a very eighties thing too. Of the breakout star is the character who has nothing else going on besides the catchphrase. Really? Yes. Yes. The baby yes. just says that and hits the father with a frying pan. That's like the yep. only thing it does. It, it worked for Urkel. Yep, it worked. And that's that's what we remember. Thanks, patrons. So let's go to our final thoughts here, Clay. The patrons didn't like this episode. What say you on our scale of one to five? I did like this one. Um I don't think it's a four, but I think it's a solid three. Uh I yeah, I don't know. Something about it just worked for me. I enjoyed it. I thought the 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 relationship stuff was handled as probably as well as you could expect it with the lead up that it had and uh yeah i mean i'm i'm not look i i don't wish that there was more of it yeah but uh i think it worked well enough and it was a fun little episode three for me as well i thought it was i thought it was just fine um i like the tone that they chose i thought that they handled it they did not embarrass themselves with it which is important to me <laughs> that seems to be the highest praise you've given this well, season is the, the that, episodes where they don't embarrass for themselves. The, that's a that's a big in some ways it's good and bad right because yeah. the embarrassing thing is actually kind of like it means that you're taking a risk too at, at that point which i think that some of the early series do but for this storyline in particular I think this could have been much worse than it is. I think sure. it gets a little yeah. bit too much hate for a. I'm surprised how short it is. It really doesn't last very long, and 
B, I think that it wraps up fine. Like it's as good as you can do. I'm going to give it a three out of five for part duration. Remember in Discovery when Ash Tyler breaks the doctor's neck? Yep. That was something, huh? That was... <laughs> Sorry, I was just thinking about, again, like if they did this on Discovery, and I'm like, I feel like this on Discovery would end with Neelix just like shiving Tom Paris yeah. down on the planet or something. Poisoning him his angel hair pasta and putting like yeah. uh, broken glass bits or dust, uh, glass dust in it. Caught up his stomach. Um, anything else did about you, this? Do you ever see those... Uh, um, YouTube videos where it's people just shooting stuff with progressively bigger guns. Uh like on like a on like a firearms dedicated channel, basically. Yes. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. They can be fun. They can uh, be. Kinda, yeah. yeah. I was watching one where this guy was shooting solid glass spheres, like big solid glass spheres with like a fifty caliber one of those gigantic guns from like a racer yep. or whatever. Yep. And uh <laughs> He, uh, they're out in the forest and he's shooting this thing with these massive bullets that are just cracking and splitting these things. And he's going over to check out the, uh, the damage and stuff. And he starts going like, <coughs> oh man, man, my allergies, my eyes, my allergies are just killing me. And everybody in the comments is like, you are breathing in aerosolized glass right now. Yep. Yep. Did you ever know the, uh, russia fps channel that was big in that in that realm for a while uh, i don't think he exists anymore is is that's not the guy that that builds like knife knife slingshots is it no it's just it's this kid who lives on like a farm in alabama or something and he he's playing a character he's playing this russian character like it's a fake accent mm-hmm. and everything but he he just has this huge open space, and for some reason, he has access to incredibly high-powered weaponry <laughs> that he tests out on this farm. And um, Hey, shall not be infringed, my friend. No, there are some really big guns <laughs> that completely destroy things when they hit something. It's interesting. Um, just for being from someone who's not particularly or has never been really exposed to any of that stuff, it's interesting to see how it actually works and like what it does and things. That's yeah. it. We're done. Thanks, everybody, for listening to the show. Clay, do you have anything you want to say? Yeah. my uh, uh, how, how many weeks from recording will this will this be out? Is this going to... This is three weeks. Three weeks? Okay. So the second issue of my White Knight Red Hood Batman book that I wrote might be out at this point. It comes out, I think, the last week of July, uh, August. Yeah, this will be. Out. Um, this should be out. <clears throat> so I think that should be out. So if if uh, you feel like picking up that the f- both issues, I'd be much obliged. Uh, yeah, and Amanda and I are still kicking on um, Rotten Horror Picture Show. We're doing. We just did for July uh, Maximum Overdrive, which is a very fun movie, very stupid movie, but a very fun movie. Yeah. And uh, August we're doing. Uh, Sometimes they come back. And I'm not sure what we're doing for September yet, but we're getting close. Man, the years, I it's going. Summer's almost done. Yeah, the hell, sad. I know. Although, yeah, now the uh, it was a beautiful summer here for the first couple months of it, but now it's getting hot, like summery. uh, You know, so it's it's a little bit more uh, difficult. That's that's the thing around here. Like, I, I feel like every year I forget that all of the the weather for the seasons around here or maybe it's everywhere because of climate change or whatever is like shifted two months down the line yeah so anytime the winter rolls around it's like christmas and like well it's actually pretty mild i know we're gonna make it through winter without snow yeah the (laughs) the winter isn't that bad and then february you're just like want to die yeah february is bad now september used to be a really nice month and now september's still hot here yeah Yeah. that's the thing like in the summer june and july not too bad but then once august and september roll around it's brutal yeah yeah makes october nice now it just pushes it it down the line. i always like a a little bit of a cooler october so yeah you know i could take it or leave it but i I enjoy it but i do like it when it's a little bit brisker yeah no agreed as for me like and the end of september still seems to get rid of the humidity and stuff which is a big yeah. big part of it so we're just yeah. we're just doing with the muggies right now unfortunately which is as offensive as wop in do wop to say that <laughs> at this point thank you very much for listening everybody we will see you next time with whatever the episode is it's all the way on the other screen see ya